Now, one of the more remarkable speeches at last week's Tory party conference was made uh, by the Home Secretary, Swella Bravman, in which she talked about luxury beliefs, uh, which is a phrase, I believe, coined by Rob Henderson, the uh, American academic. Um, but it's also something that our next guest, Matt Goodwin, um, talks about. Matt has a new book called Values, Voice and Virtue. Uh, and Matt, you've written quite a lot about this subject. Uh, can you define for us, first of all, for anyone who hasn't um, heard the term before, what luxury beliefs are and why they represent an opportunity for the Tory party? Yeah, sure. Uh, luxury beliefs really refer to ideas or views which confer status on members of the elite, which bring members of the elite few costs, but which impose very heavy costs on other people. So an example of a luxury belief might be uh, members of the political media cultural class calling for large scale immigration because they're the least likely to suffer the negative effects of that. But we know from research, working class non-graduate voters are the most likely to suffer the effects of that or similarly calling for a more relaxed approach to family. Whereas we know members of the the elite are the most likely to get married, stay married and have children within marriage. It's everybody else that suffers from the collapse of, of those guardrails. So luxury belief is luxury beliefs are really about the sort of hypocrisy that lie at the, the heart of uh, some people in the elite. And for the Conservative Party, when it comes to issues like migration, diversity, identity, family, crime, uh, some prominent uh, uh, politicians, Swella Braverman included, clearly think that there's some political capital to be had by zooming in on some of those contradictions. Do you think perhaps there isn't as much political capital as perhaps Swella Braverman thinks? Because we've just had the Labour Party conference, and uh, I think it's quite clear that Keir Starmer is, is playing down that sort of politics. Uh, he's trying not to talk, even if these issues are salient he's not talking about them or he's dismissing them as populism without getting too stuck in them i i think there's another view which is you know labor are playing a very risky game when it comes to these these issues because you know look since the the brexit referendum we were often told that that voters don't really care about these these issues around immigration and identity anymore well we know that that's not true uh, we know that for example, migration, both legal and illegal, is back to being the third most important issue for all voters and the most important issue for those 2019 Conservative voters who only last week rated it above the economy, which is really quite remarkable when you consider we're in the most severe cost of living crisis for half a century. And even still, many of those voters who, of course, left Labour for Boris Johnson are saying that for them, immigration is is still a paramount issue. So for Labour and Keir Starmer to downplay that issue, to essentially not talk about it during the Labour conference, there's a little bit of discussion about, you know, smashing the gangs, but there wasn't really a sort of serious discussion about either how to bring down legal migration or how to actually um, prevent illegal migration over the longer term. Um, I would argue that's a very risky political strategy for Labour and leaves the Conservatives, you know, with a big opening if they can if they can find a way to to kick a football into it. Um, and what about I mean, obviously, migration is a huge one. And as you point out, there is there is some capital there for the Tories politically. Um, but on other issues, do you think it's fair to say that the, the slur of populism is more uh, effective than it is perhaps in America? Because we often hear said, and it's it's not just an elite opinion, uh, we often hear said that Brits, Brits don't particularly like these issues coming into politics. They don't like, you know, woke issues. They don't like transgenderism as a political subject. It turns them off uh, in both directions, left and right. I, you know, I don't find that particularly convincing. I mean, if you look at the issues that we often refer to as, as quote, unquote, culture wars, these issues are often actually very central to the way in which people think about their lives. So immigration is a great example. About 75% of people would like to lower overall migration. They think it's been too high over the last decade. Uh, they think it's been badly managed. If you look, for example, at gender issues, well, 
in Scotland, when people began to look at the gender recognition reform bill, they became really interested in it. And of course, 80 percent said this is a terrible idea. If you look at issues like crime, uh, the British public are consistently more hardline than both uh, Labour and Conservative politicians. And if you look at issues like political correctness or, or you know, woke ideology, um, you know, that, again, is is something that concerns about 60 percent of Brits who say they feel in today's climate they can't really say what they want to to say. So I, I don't buy the argument that, uh, you know, so-called culture wars, which, by the way, you know, these issues are often foundational to to who we are, the rights of family, the rights of women, sex based rights, history, identity. You know, this is all pretty central stuff. I, I, I don't think you can just push this out of politics. I think this is now in the center of politics and in the public square. And so that's why we saw Rishi Sunak in Manchester make explicit reference to these issues in his speech. Now, a critic would say he was also rather vague about what he wanted to do. You know, he said, a woman is a woman, a man is a man. What does that mean the Conservatives are going to do what the Republicans have done in terms of intervening in schools and universities? And, and you know, Suella Braverman, what she said, and I've polled it, is very popular in the country. 66% of all Brits think that mass immigration is an existential challenge to the West. But what are the actual policies that the Conservatives are going to introduce? Are they going to reduce legal migration? Are they going to increase the salary thresholds that are currently allowing, I would argue, um, too much low school migration? Are they going to clamp down on international students and their dependents in a more long-term, sustainable way? You know, these are all things that we don't really have the answers to. So it's difficult for the Conservatives to outflank Labour on migration because they they haven't really gone all in when it comes to delivering a policy that would act, actually meet uh, a majority of British voters where they are. So it makes it very difficult for the Conservatives. There is an opportunity, but they have to bring the policies forward to seize it. But you were quite uh, caustic about the term culture wars there, and I, and I get what you mean. But isn't that precisely what you're getting at there, that for a lot of voters... Uh, if it's just talk, if it's just uh, headlines and the odd statement um, by the Tories about stopping the boats or uh, pro-family or whatever, um, if, if there aren't any serious pro-family policies put in place, um, then voters don't really care either way what either party's saying. Voters are very disillusioned across the board. I recently polled um uh, a big nationally representative sample of voters. And I asked them, what are the issues that you feel really concerned about, but also feel you're not represented on? Number one was immigration. Most people want it lowered. Most people want it slowed down. Neither of the parties are committed to that. Number two was political correctness. People feeling like they cannot say what they think. Neither party is seriously committed to rooting out uh, this sort of stifling um, you know, progressive ideology, so-called progressive ideology in the institutions, which has left so many people feeling as though they can't really say what they, they want, want, want to say. And the third was promoting Britain's distinctive identity, history and culture against what many people feel is a sort of bland globalization, universal liberal ideology that sort of celebrates diversity, but isn't really all that interested in the distinctive things about Britain, the things that make us British or English or Welsh or Scottish. And, and those are the things that people really do feel animated about. And all politics is about supply and demand. And I think in Britain, what we've got at the moment is actually lots of public demand for a different kind of politics. But we don't have much supply. We don't have either Labour or the Conservative Party really meeting voters on those on those issues. And so this big consensus that we have, a kind of big state, uh, high tax, uh, kind of uh, low productivity, high immigration, um, you know, London centric economy still it, it is alienating a lot of voters. They do want to talk about these issues. They do want to talk about what their kids are being taught around sex, gender and race. They do want to talk about the constant revision of British history. They do care about these things, about their shared identity. They also care about the cost of living. They also care about housing. But I simply don't buy the argument that these are fringe issues which politicians shouldn't talk about. Because if you want to see one politician, and you know this much better than me, Freddie, if you want to see one politician who's riding high in the polls still and who's talking a lot about this, where well, you look at America and you can see with the Republicans and the current polling that they are still actually holding together the post-2016 realignment. If you look at how strongly supportive working class voters are of um, uh, Donald Trump, non-graduates, pensioners, uh, small towners, suburban women, 
All the groups, by the way, that the British Tories have managed to alienate and lose over the last uh, few years, certainly since 2019, the Republicans are actually in play. I mean, they've still got that realignment. And irrespective of how you feel about Donald Trump, as a, as a case study of how to hold together a coalition, and by the way, they've also eaten into Hispanic Latino voters in a significant way, you know, they've done that partly by leaning into many of these cultural questions, by actually recognising that voters want to have a conversation about the things that make them who, they're, who they are, their history, their identity, their culture, what we teach our children. Uh, now, whether the British Tories decide to step into that, not, not necessarily saying they should become a, a Trumpian party, but if they become a more interventionist party on these issues, a more culturally conservative party that's willing to actually have a conversation with the country about these issues, then I suspect they will have a lot more room for manoeuvre um, at the elections to come. I suppose it's quite a difficult thing to prove, uh, but it seems to me from a from an observational point of view that uh, the more popular these issues become with the public, the more uh, the progressive ruling class uh, who hold these luxury opinions um, harden in their views. And I think we see that within the Conservative Party of it's not that the Conservatives disagree necessarily, it's just that they associate it with a sort of politics they find ugly and probably in a snobbish sense, because this is to a large extent a class division. Yeah, well, I think that's spot on. I think if you, you know, why is it that the British Tories, unlike Conservatives in Italy, Sweden, France and America, have actually been very reluctant to get involved? It doesn't take you long in the Tory movement to find somebody who's critical of Suella Braverman. I mean, what she's come out and said has actually been quite unpopular around the cabinet table. Why is that? Because they're status conscious Tories. I mean, they are, they view cultural issues as being beneath them. Uh, They view issues around migration and and integration and and sex and gender and history and statues. You know, all this stuff is kind of, you know, lowbrow. It's not status driven politics. And that's where they're missing a trick. I mean, that's where they are really struggling. And if you look at the 2019 electorate that rallied around Boris Johnson, you know, wanting lower migration, stronger borders, tough approach on crime, promoting Britain's distinctive identity and history, which, you know, we've seen over the last three and four years be consistently eroded by the advance of of radical progressivism. Uh, The Conservatives are only holding about 60% of that vote now. So, you know, about 40% has basically left the party. A big chunk's gone to Labour, a big chunk's gone to reform, um, but a bigger chunk has said, you know, I'm not going to vote at the next election. I'm completely disillusioned. And so, What I often say to cabinet ministers, and I said to one last week, is, you know, we are now in a world where voters basically want security. They and they don't just want economic security from the cost of living crisis, from the uh, from the declining living standards. They don't just want physical security from a collapsing national health service. They don't just want um, national security from small boats, from rising immigration, from culturally different groups who we've seen this week protesting and supporting the atrocities in in Israel on the streets of London, they also want cultural security. They want a a cultural security from this oppressive, stifling orthodoxy, which has left them feeling as though, well, if they don't agree with radical progressives on on pro-immigration, pro-globalization, pro-social liberalism, they're going to be outcast. You know, they might lose their jobs or they might be silenced. And I think this cultural security notion is one that's going to become increasingly central to our politics, especially given the fact that 85 to 90 percent of voters in Britain really do feel very strongly attached to Britain. They feel proud of the country. They um, they view their national identity as a key part of who they are. That's not like the people who dominate many of the institutions. They It's not to say they don't like Britain, but they don't attach as much importance to their national identity. So this rift is going to become still, I think, much more central to our politics as we navigate the 2020s and beyond. Uh, Lastly, Matt, uh, just as a matter of curiosity, have you, in all of your polling, picked up a strong desire uh, among the British public to ban smoking for young people? Um, Not consistently. I mean, I've not polled it um, extensively myself and I've not, not focus grouped it. But if you look at some of the polling that we have had since the ban, um... YouGov, uh, I think I'm right in saying, find that a plurality is supportive of the ban, um, a minority oppose it. Um, but uh, I've not done any 
uh, detailed work on it. But probably fair to say it's not a priority for British voters. Oh, it's it's no, it's not a priority at all. And actually, one of the things I wrote about in uh, on on my Substack was about um, you know Sunak's speech was bizarre for that reason, which is if you look at the top three issues for all voters in the country, number one is cost of living, number two is NHS, and number three is migration. And migration is both legal and illegal. Um, and the problem is, you know, he decided to focus on the smoking ban, A levels and a train line into Northern England. And these are just not salient issues for the country. And I wonder why he went so far off the grid in his conference speech. And when you compare and contrast that to Keir Starmer's, I have to say, even though Starmer played down immigration, which I mentioned was risky, he did at least talk a lot about the salient issues, about the cost of living crisis, about the state of the NHS, about housing, about some of these really big totemic issues. And I think Sunak, you know, I understand the strategy of being more combative, but he's got to get back to those top three issues very quickly. It's probably status driven. Um, Matt, thank you very much indeed. Uh, everyone should read your new book, uh, Values, Voice and Virtue. Uh, and please come on Spectator TV again soon. Thanks. Thanks.